A little while ago, LGR made a video about the software that was used to generate the 90s magic eye pictures, more properly called auto stereograms or just stereograms. It's a good video, you should watch it, but if you're looking for an explanation of how the software actually generates the pictures, how the pictures work, you won't find it there, that's not what the video's about. That's what this video's about. Human depth perception, that is, how our brains estimate how far away something is, works in a few different ways. The simplest is perspective. We know how big most things are, and if they look smaller than that, it generally means they're far away. A little bit more advanced is parallax. That's kind of just perspective for motion. When you move your head, every object you see will appear to move too, by the same distance. And because that distance looks smaller for far away objects, this lets you use perspective to estimate distance without having to know how large the objects are. This is often used by retro style video games to create a sense of depth to the background layers, even when each layer is purely 2D. You can also estimate distances using focus, that is you look at an object, adjust the focus of your eye until it's looking nice and sharp, and then estimate the distance to the object based on how much you had to flex your focusing muscles. For the purposes of this video, we're going to look at just one method of estimating distance, binocular vision. Assuming you have sight in both eyes, you can estimate the distance to an object by comparing the angles from each eye to the object. If the object is far away, then it will be almost the same angle from your left eye to the object as it is from your right eye to the object. If the object is very nearby, the angles will be much more different. In a sense, this method is also just perspective. You just don't have to move your head because you're already seeing the scene from two points a non-distance apart. This binocular vision can be fooled. Everything from VR headsets to Victorian stereoscopes did this by showing each eye a different copy of an image, and using lenses to make them appear to be further away than they really are. Your brain naturally assumes that each eye is seeing the same object, and by moving around the real objects on the screens, we can control where the image of the object ends up, both horizontally and forwards and backwards. This is also roughly how 3D movies and 3D glasses work, although the geometry is slightly different there because both images are actually in the same place and we use light filters to make sure that each eye only sees one of them. And obviously that's not how you generate images for 3D glasses, you just take two photos, one for each eye, and then overlay them. But this is why that works, in terms that also apply to stereograms. I'm going to be glossing over the vertical direction in this video because well, it isn't terribly interesting or relevant, uh, the vertical position of objects works exactly how you'd expect and doesn't interact with depth perception at all. The reason horizontal motion is special is because your eyes are separated horizontally. If your eyes were stacked one on top of the other, I'd be talking about vertical motion and glossing over the horizontal. It's also worth noting that all of these illusions only affect binocular depth perception. In all of them, your eyes remain focused at the same distance even when they're converging on different distances. This discrepancy, called vergence accommodation conflict, means your brain is getting two conflicting messages about the distance to an object. For most people that's not a big issue, but for some people it can cause eye strain and disorientation and it's probably not a good idea to spend too much time in that condition. But that's a dual image stereogram. We're interested in single image stereograms, auto stereograms. How can we create the same illusion when both eyes are seeing exactly the same image? Suppose you're looking at a wall that's behind an iron fence. If the geometry is just right, the fence can appear further away than it really is. There's always some part of the wall that your left eye can't see because it's behind a fence post, and if it just so happens that your right eye can't see it either because it's behind another identical fence post, then your brain's not going to figure that out. Both your eyes are pointing at the same patch of wall and they're seeing the same thing, so naturally the brain interprets that as just one post that is right up against the wall. Even without a wall behind them, you can use this trick to make a repeating pattern like a fence appear further away than it really is, by forcing your eyes to look through the fence rather than at it. This way you can line up the posts and your brain will see an illusory post for each pair of posts in the real fence. The reason there are only four posts in the illusory fence when there were five in the original image is, quite coincidentally, an example of the fence post problem. The spacing between the posts dictates how far away the illusory fence appears. So what happens if we make the spacing uneven? Here we're going to use a pattern where the spacing increases as we move to the right. I'm 
going to stop pretending it's a fence now. From this point on, they're just going to be repeating objects. You can see that the illusory object formed by the leftmost pair is significantly nearer than the illusory object formed by the rightmost pair, which are further apart. In fact, each pair of objects is completely independent, so we can vary the spacing however we like to produce an arbitrary depth pattern. Remember that we're essentially ignoring the vertical dimension here. That works out to be quite convenient because it means the pattern of spaced dots is completely one-dimensional. We can stack as many of them on top of each other as we like, and the result is a two-dimensional array of illusory points behind the page, each of which is a different distance from the observer. And that's starting to sound a lot like a stereogram. So how do we turn our depth map into a stereogram? The stereogram is made from two images. The most important is the depth map. It's usually a computer-generated image of a 3D scene, but instead of being texture mapped and realistically lit, it's simply a black and white image where nearby objects look white and far away objects look black. Or vice versa, it doesn't matter. It ends up looking rather like a scene of white objects in a particularly foggy PlayStation 1 game. These are fairly easy to make in software like Blender. They calculate the depth anyway, and at least Blender will natively let you export it. The second image is the repeating pattern you see when you first look at the stereogram, and this is just a normal picture. Often it's a totally abstract pattern. The key consideration is that it shouldn't have large spaces of solid colour, unless your depth map is very simple. Because we can consider each row of pixels separately, I'm going to consider these images as if they're just one pixel high. In practice, of course, they'd be much taller, but we can stack them when we're finished. First, we turn the depth map into numbers, where each number just represents the distance between your eye and where this pixel should appear in 3D space. These will need scaling. In practice, they'd vary from about 50 to 200, rather than 1 to 5, like they do in this toy example, but this will show the process just fine. Then we turn that depth map into coloured pixels. Again, we're just generating one row of pixels, and we'll eventually repeat this process for the rest of the image. We'll need slightly more pixels than there are in our depth map because of that fence boss problem. Those extra pixels can be any colour we like, and this is where we inject our pattern image. For now though, let's just make them blue, red and green. Next, we look at the pixels of the depth map in turn. The first few are a depth of 3, which means we need the spacing of the repeated pattern to be 3 pixels. So for each one, we look 3 pixels to the left, and whatever colour we find there, we repeat. Effectively what we've done is to create 3 separate fences, a blue one, a red one, and a green one, and we can vary their spacings however we need. So for example, the next few pixels get further away, which means our pattern needs to get wider. Because we don't have any more pixels to work with, that means we end up repeating a few, and that's okay, that's not a problem. As the pattern narrows again, you see we actually skip over the red pixel. Again, that's okay. In a real stereogram, the pattern would be one or two hundred pixels wide, so the odd pixel here or there really isn't going to matter. That's actually enough to create a stereogram. If you look at this image from Karen Puzzle's stereogram video, which I have to assume landed so close to LGRs by coincidence, not even Karen could put this together so fast as a response you'll see the left-hand side of the image shows an undistorted pattern, and the distortions build up as you move to the right. That's obviously not ideal. It would look nicer if the undistorted image were in the middle, and it would also mean you only got half as much distortion by the time you reached the edge of the image. But you can't just put the pattern in the middle and then propagate it left as well as right. That leaves a visible seam in the 3D scene. But you can use a bit of lateral thinking to get the right effect. For this example, we'll generate the same stereogram, but this time we'll start off just to the left of the centre of the image. Exactly how far left isn't important, but for now, let's look at the first four in the depth map. Four pixels to the left is a pixel we haven't coloured in yet, so we can make this pixel any colour we like. Let's take a colour from our nice undistorted pattern. Next for five. Again, we're repeating a pixel we haven't coloured, so I'll take the next pixel from our pattern. Eventually we hit a pixel we have already coloured in, and from here on we just repeat colours like we did before. When we hit the end of the image, it's time to fill in the left hand side. We need a little overlap, so this time we'll start slightly to the right of the centre of the image. Let's look at the second four in the depth map. Just like last time we looked at it, this is repeating a pixel we haven't coloured in yet. But if this pixel is orange, then the pixel it's repeating must be orange, so we can colour that one in. The next pixel along is a 5, and we can do the same trick to colour in another pixel. 
This leaves a gap in the pattern. That's a pixel that isn't repeated by anything, so we can make it any color we like. We continue this process until we run out of pixels and the image is filled. Sometimes pixels will overwrite one another, and again that's okay. In a real example, the repeating pattern would be much wider and this wouldn't matter at all. There's one last trick to making the stereogram look really nice. Suppose we've got a 200 pixel wide pattern image, and the middle of our image is at a depth of only 100. If our pattern image is an attractive design rather than just random colours, we don't want to repeat only the first half of it. We want to compress the image to the required width and then repeat all of it. This requires a slight change to our algorithm, but only a slight one. Consider that first four again. Not only is there no colour to fill in, but there's nothing in our pixel map at all. We want to take a colour from our pattern, so let's take the leftmost pixel from it. That is, the pixel 0% of the way along it. Next, we look at the next pixel. Again, it's not repeating anything, but we can look at the pixel to the left. We know that at a depth of 5, we should be repeating the pattern every 5 pixels, so let's move 1 fifth or 20% of the way along the pattern. This pixel will take its colour from the pixel 20% of the way along our pattern. The next 5 again can't repeat anything, so it adds another 20%. The 4 implies a narrower repeating pattern, so it adds 25% of the pixel position, taking us to 65%. And there are other ways you could calculate these coordinates, but this is how I do it and it works well. Ultimately the illusion works whatever colour these pixels are, so it's a stylistic choice how you do it. If this number were to get above 100%, of course we'd simply wrap around to 0, but as it happens the pattern starts repeating before that happens. Again, when we get to the end of the image, we start propagating the colours back left, although this time we're thinking about X coordinates in the pattern image rather than colours themselves. This time, when we hit the 5 and leave that gap, the empty pixel is at a depth of 3, so we fill it in by stepping one third of the way along the pattern. This is where you're more likely to have to wrap around from 100% to 0, but in this case we land on 73% and don't need to. Otherwise, the algorithm works exactly as before. Finally, we take our stored coordinates and look at the actual colours from the pattern image. And that's it! Now you know everything you need to generate a stereogram. I've made a tool that will handle a lot of the implementation for you, but nevertheless having an understanding of how they work will absolutely help you get the most out of it. That said, there are a few nuances you'll want to know if you want to get the best out of these images. Magic Eye stereograms were a big craze in the 90s and it was in some ways the only time that could have happened. Computers were good enough that we could easily generate high-resolution illusions, but they weren't so good that YouTube and mobile internet had really taken off, which means they mostly got distributed as physical books, pictures, prints, album covers and so on. That's important because the size of a stereogram can make a big difference to the effect. It's all to do with the angle the object makes with your eyes, and the distance between your eyes is, hopefully, fixed. So really binocular vision only works well for pretty nearby objects. As things get further away, the ray entering your left eye and the ray entering your right eye become closer and closer to parallel. If you blow up a stereogram until the width of the repeating pattern is the same as the distance between your eyes, then the lines actually will be parallel and the illusion will appear infinitely far away. Which sounds impossible, but it's fine. Most things look infinitely far away in practice. If you look up at the Andromeda Galaxy, which is 2.5 million light years away, or even a tree 50 meters away, the angle between the rays will be imperceptibly small. Things being infinitely far away is technically impossible, but effectively really common in optics calculations. What causes problems is if you keep blowing up that stereogram past the point where the rays are parallel. Mathematically, this means the object should be behind you, an arguably more reasonable interpretation is that it's more than infinitely far in front of you. In any case, actually most people won't see anything because they just can't diverge their eyes that far. I guess because while humans were evolving, there were very few things more than infinitely far away for us to look at. Or if there were, they couldn't hurt us. I think this is why a lot of people in the comments of Karen's video weren't able to see the stereograms. If you're watching it on a phone, you can probably do them. If you're watching it on a big TV at the end of a room, it might not be possible. 
I don't know how big the jigsaws themselves would printed, it may not have been possible to do them in person either. To that end, I'm not just presenting my stereograms as images. I've built them as a JavaScript widget so you can adjust the pattern width for yourself depending on your screen size, how far away it is, how far apart your eyes are, and just how good you are at resolving stereograms. Although you don't need to think about all that, just aim for the widest pattern you can resolve. Personally, I've actually always found it much easier to cross my eyes than to diverge them. That means effectively you're looking at a point just in front of the stereogram rather than just behind it. Unfortunately, crossing your eyes instead of diverging them reverses the depth map. Pixels that should look far away appear close by and vice versa. I've added a tick box to my widget which effectively reverses the depth map again, so if you tick this box and then resolve the stereogram by going cross-eyed, you'll see the correct image. The principle is exactly the same in both cases, the choice between them is an arbitrary one on the part of the person making the stereogram, but I've never seen one that expects you to cross your eyes that I didn't make myself, and I've never understood why this should be. Obviously it makes sense for all stereograms to work in the same way so that when people encounter one they know what to do, but it always seemed to me that as a society we got this one wrong. As I said, I've always found it much easier to resolve stereograms backwards than forwards. That may not be true for other people, but it also solves the problem of stereograms not working on large screens, and it gives you more scope to use wider patterns for more striking 3D effects. The advice that was given in the 90s for resolving stereograms was to put them behind a sheet of glass and look at the reflection of some object in the glass. The reflection will be behind the stereogram and you'll end up resolving it by recreating the fence illusion from the start of the video. And that works, but place the image behind a sheet of glass is not always a very practical piece of advice. At least it wasn't in the 90s, it's probably a lot easier if you're looking at it on your phone. On the other hand, the trick where to do a cross-eyed version is to just hold any small object in front of it and move it back and forth until everything lines up and the image clicks into place. Any small object is much easier to come by than a conveniently sized sheet of glass, and it has the added advantage that you can move it around much more easily than you can move reflections. But my suspicion is that it was an arbitrary choice and I do kind of wish it had gone the other way. In any case, I've always found these images kind of miraculous. A single 2D image that bursts into 3D without the need for special glasses or lenses or any equipment beyond your eyes. It's one of those things that feels like it didn't have to be possible, but people figured out how to do it anyway. I think they're always going to be a source of fascination for anyone who grew up in the 90s, and hopefully people who grew up after that will get to experience them too, and if my little app can help with that, then so much better. I'm going to close this video out with a few examples of stereograms, and I'll try to vary the pattern widths and whether you should cross or uncross your eyes to see them. You might need to pause and scan back and forth a bit to find the settings that are best for you, which should do wonders for my view type stats. If you want more control, or to make your own, there's a link in the description to the full app. Or if it's easier, here's a QR code. You're right, I promise there is a QR code in there. Here's a real one. Now enjoy the stereo, guys.